So again, welcome back from lunch. Um, I'm Jessica Varner, a PhD student here at MIT within the Architecture, History, Theory, and Criticism program. And it's my sincere pleasure to introduce the second panel today, titled Traveling Case, which speculates on the significance of Case 3 at MIT, Case 5 at the University of Oregon, and Case 6 at MIT in Boston. Now, to bound these meetings is to situate loose pieces together. Loose pieces which all question architecture's ability to reach out towards other disciplines, towards political activism, and towards societal engagement. Reaching outside of architecture's standard grasp was not every case member's ideal. In fact, it became a polarizing theme. On one side, sat members who believed architecture and practice itself was the goal. On the other side, and the subject of this panel, are the case members who understood architecture to be part of a larger political and social context, one which required interdisciplinary thinking, problem solving, and activism as part of architect's toolkit. Case three, five, and six may be seen as aberrant from other case meetings, though I would like to posit the underlying push from these meetings was part of the atmosphere of case from the start. To illustrate the opposing side's voice, let me begin with the telling quote. In response to Case's first editorial statement in 1965, participant Colin Rowe here writes this letter dated June 18, 1965 to a young Stanford Anderson. Quote, one wishes for a title without naively activist overtones, end quote suggesting even the group's name was too political for Roe. Roe continues, quote, it also has a sentimentalist, activist, vitalistic tone. It uses the word total, total environment, total architecture, etc. God knows how many times, end quote. And finally, Roe writes in conclusion, I think that already there is a note of too great sobriety and liberalistic tolerance about our group. Can something not be done about it, end quote. Rose's sentiment was not singular. Many in Case's group questioned architecture's role in political issues of the 1960s, such as war, protests, the growing environmental concerns, and civil rights issues. As the group's divide heightened, certain members even threatened to secede and form Case West group, which would engage more freely in political and social issues. Certain members pushed against prior modernist factions and reached out productively to other disciplines, politics, and alternative methodologies within architecture. Case three, five, and six provided the forum for such debates set on campuses both east and west. The case three MIT event provides us all with the group's most interdisciplinary engagement, though to note the campus was a prominent site for political activism in the 1960s as well. MIT's architecture faculty members were key in making the political stands visible on campus here. In a crescendo event following many protests, shown here on the pages of A&D, the Kresge in 1968, a protest structure created by case participants Robert Goodman, who spoke earlier, Hank Millen, and many others included a tent city, a scaffolding structure, and an occupation of the main public space. Now, while political engagements did not focus in case, direct, case 3 directly, it is easy to see how the atmosphere fed into the members' thinking. Case 3 was open to science's influences and instead focused on the brain. Titled Perception and Creativity, the 1966 weekend event took place at the MIT Endicott House, a 25-acre estate southwest of Boston in Dedham, Massachusetts, perhaps a better setting than this aesthetic uh, conference room today. Organized by Professor Stanford Anderson with Hank Millen, the event sought to end, quote, this is quote, end the isolation from other disciplines, end quote. Sessions with grand sweeping titles such as Perception and Creativity included participants such as psychologist Richard Hell, neurophysiologist David Hubble, who was later a Nobel Prize winner, and philosopher Mark Orkowski on aesthetic perception. The influence of Christian Norval Schultz and his 1965 publication, Intention in Architecture, which looked at the perception and the role of intention, was apparent as Colin Rowe and Robert Slutsky also gave the talk 
on the physical and phenomenal destination, uh, definition of space in art and architecture. Case 3 was interdisciplinary par excellence, yet found a way to productively engage both science and architecture in the same conversation. Later, MIT Dean Lawrence Anderson also commented on the effects of interdis the interdisciplinary ethos at MIT as focused on, quote, a more friendly architecture or more interested in the quality of materials and attention to the climate and local conditions that seem to be the case, to seem to not be the case with doctrinaire modernist, end quote. And case five here at the University of Oregon offers us the more politically active example. The teaching at the University of Oregon on January 30th through February 3rd in 1967, organized by Professor Donlan Linden, orbited around larger societal and political issues, including architecture's relationship to the environment, politics, and the discipline's societal role. Donlan here also today. Referred to fondly as the Traveling Zoo, which is the namesake of this panel, by Linden, the teaching format echoed more directly the political de demonstrations on campuses across the United States. The University of Oregon, in fact, was a primary and early site for such demonstrations. For example, the Johnson Hall sleep-in, where students overtook the main administration building in 1966 in opposition to the ROTC and the Vietnam War or more directly involving architecture students here, the Poverty Shed protest in 1967, which created and utilized a large, Luigi-like structure to protest American excess and world poverty. Or perhaps my favorite, and the most Oregonian, the 1965 protest, a tree demonstration lunch, where students and locals inhabited the traffic median as campus officials tried to cut down university trees. Case 5 used the activist idea of occupation by mingling amongst existing third and fourth year studios and faculty at the School of Architecture and added to the curriculum during Case's week-long stay. The teaching's activist agenda was apparent also in the planned seminars, include here environmental co controls by Thomas Freeland, environmental problems and politics and architecture by Hill, and placemaking and problem solving by Slutsky. And to note, the red lines are that this was an ever-changing um, event, and therefore people came and went. At Oregon, the debate over architecture's role in such political issues was not fully discussed, as many primary case members did not attend, such as Peter Eisman or Richard Meyer. Though the many absences were not understood as an act of defiance, Anderson later, later stated, quote, they didn't object, they just weren't there, end quote. An absence in this case could also be easily understood as passive resistance to the activist agendas at play. Correlations can be drawn between Case 5's activism and the later smaller MIT Boston Case 6, an accompanying exhibition in the fall of 1968, organized again by Professor Anderson, the actual case meeting engaged MIT students over the course of a full year and began in an exhibit then culminated by Anderson and students. MIT faculty member Maurice Smith built a small entry stair. And the exhibit was part of a longer MIT engagement. Pedagogy met, met, met activism. And it should be noted again that many non-case members were included in case six. And the reception was mixed. Professor Anderson noted that, pers quote, personal friendships were not lost, but the New York area members and perhaps others of CASE were not pleased with the content, end quote. In the loose structure of CASE 6, perhaps the aim to reach out had gone past the limits of architecture's grasp. If the CASE 3 meeting at MIT, the CASE 5 teaching at Oregon, and the CASE 6 Boston MIT meeting can be understood as the product of those within CASE seeking a more politically, socially, and environmentally engaged response inside the field of architecture. Our panelists today perhaps can elaborate on how CASE engaged the problems of the day and how we can learn from such attempts to those issues which continue to haunt the halls of MIT and every institution today. So before the panel join us, let me introduce the members. Today, our moderator this afternoon, Michael Hayes, 
is the Elliott Noyes Professor of Architectural Theory at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Professor Hayes has been at Harvard since 1988, and his influential work spans European modernism, critical theory, as well as issues in contemporary practice. Professor Hayes was also the founder of a well-known assemblage journal, which we were chatting about at lunch, for which I've spent many hours shifting through on JSTOR. Also, our panelists, our first panelist, Mark Dreisenbeck, who brings a wealth of MIT knowledge to the table. Professor Dreisenbeck is a professor in history of theory at architecture here at MIT, and his work ranges from the 12th century to the modern era, with a particular focus on the 19th and 20th century aesthetics, and he is an advocate for global history. He has many accolades and publications under his belt, which I won't miss, but I would like to mention his generosity and leadership in education here at MIT is apparent and appreciated everywhere within our department. And Don Lynn Linden, case member, and Eva Lee Professor Emeritus at Architecture and Urban Design at the University of California, Berkeley, formerly head of architecture at MIT and the University of Oregon. Linden was the founding editor of Places Journal, an author of books and architectural works, including Pembroke Dorm Dormitories at Brown University, and a place near and dear to my West Coast heart, Sea Ranch Condominium One with MLTW. And finally, case member Stanford Anderson from MIT, where he's taught since 1963, an advisory professor in Chongqi University in Shanghai. He writes on architectural theory, modern architecture, American urbanism, epistemology and historiography, and has pu published many books and articles on such subjects. He is co-founder and director of our year HTC program at MIT, and we'll begin this afternoon. So please welcome me and join the panelists to the uh, table, but also um, Professor Anderson is going to begin, sorry, hop on up. Professor Anderson is going to begin with the presentation. Uh, maybe I'll be happier at the architecture school 
I went over to, just as an adventure, I went over to Avery and it was pretty empty. But I opened the door to a studio room and there were two guys sitting and talking to one another. And one of them said, come on in. That was Peter. And it's been Peter's uh, attitude ever since. You know, he's the one who created Prince and one and invited many people, including me. He's the one who really negotiated the new city ex uh, exhibition of MoMA and invited the members of the case to come in, including me. Uh, he's the one who invited me into the, into the institute to, to work on a project. You know, over the years, Peter has been both a faithful friend and a big supporter. Uh, and that, despite the fact that our, our thinking is somewhat different. And we're going to explore some of that differences, the differences today. Now, what I've prepared to say, I'm sorry to say it's a little bit redundant, but I'll, I think it's best to just go ahead. Uh, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to, uh, actually, I'm supposed to be talking about case three and case six, right now, case three. Uh, and the way I'm going to come at it is by reflecting on some of the experience of the first Princeton meeting, the way, the way topics there came to shape what became case three. And uh, I also want to begin by recognizing that there were three figures, more senior figures, at Princeton One uh, that uh, were important to that event. Colin Rowe of Cornell, Vincent Scully of Yale, and Robert Venturi of Penn. They were all about a decade older than most of the participants and had the more established careers in popular that seniority. Colin Rowe had been a mentor to Eisenman at both Cornell and Cambridge. Rowe and I found mutual interest in our independent studies of the scientific epistemology of Karl Popper. Rowe's impressive essays on modern architecture, especially on Corbusier, were well known and respected by all the participants at Princeton. Rowe continued as a member of CASE throughout its history. My assessment is that Colin was especially effective in resisting the occasional flirtation with utopian and messianic schemes, faults he had already criticized in the history of modern architecture. Vincent Scully, Vincent Scully, a senior professor at Yale, arrived with a quite ambiguous, ambitious agenda. He showed interest in a group manifesto. He was also constructive, offering the products of his, this new group could find a place in Yale's noted journal, Perspective. I would assess that Scully arrived with the thought that he might be the effective senior person in this potential group. However, on the one hand, he alienated some of the Penn participants by his overt criticism of the work of Venturi, and, on the other hand, there was strong criticism of Scully, particularly by Hank Millen. Scully politely withdrew from the group before the second meeting. And the third, more senior person, Robert Venturi, had completed his mother's house and the visiting nurses' headquarters. With the notable exception of Michael McKinnell as co-designer of Boston City Hall, Venturi was the more advanced in practice uh, than the other participants. The position Venturi took at Princeton is best explained in my second topic, the initial round of the table discussion. But I can anticipate that discussion by noting that Venturi was emphatic in his decision not to join the group. Okay, so some comment now on the initial round of the discussion. And it should be clear that I'm but making selections here in order to lead to case three, not to try to do a summary of the entire uh, Princeton one. In the first substantive session of Princeton uh, one, Eisenman gave an account of why he and some of his colleagues had brought the meeting into being. The entire morning was devoted to statements by each of the people present. We will come to a summary of Eisenman's position after he is confronted with the objections of Robert Venturi. Venturi arrived with a prepared statement. This is, and here's Venturi. This is going to be a meeting about abstract ideas and directions. I really don't know what my ideas are and my directions are until I can relate them to my specific problems as a builder, as an architect. My frustration does not come from lack of opportunity to talk or to propagandize or to expose my ideas I have as a teacher. My thoughts, my thinking, 
concerns, ideas, and direction in architecture as an artist must be related, must be a byproduct, and must be related to working and to doing. Really, one of the, our great problems is simply this. Architects are not given the opportunity to start soon enough. He was constantly looking for how one would get commissions. Now, this antagonism to thought came despite the fact that Venturi was then at work on complexity and contradiction, which first appeared only months later in Perspective 9, an essay which I would think was filled with ideas that seemed more likely to have generated rather than to have flowed from doing his mother's house. Those participants who were in practice or closer to professional work all endorsed Venturi's position. That would be McKinnell, Richard Meyer, Tim Breland, and to a lesser extent, Bob Kimmel. The doers provoked this response from Eisenman, so this is a kind of summary of his initial position. Eisenman, I'd like to come down very strongly in opposition to Messrs. Venturi, McKinnell, Breland, perhaps Clement and Meyer to a less degree, for what I think is a very limited objective and make so many assumptions that are intolerable to me, facing just the problem of teaching or facing the problem of building. The assumption is, is that if we all were to have jobs or to be given commissions, we would produce a better architecture because we are young and have ideas or just because of who we are. There is an assumption that we are prepared or have been preparing people today for these problems. That what we are saying in school is effective. That we are, in effect, saying the right things. And Mr. Venturi says that he gets a chance to stay, say, quite enough and doesn't feel the need to talk anymore. I'm not so sure what he is saying is not right, but if it is being overshadowed by three or four other people who perhaps have a conflicting position, I'm not so sure this conflicting position shouldn't be aired. Thus, from the first session of the first meeting, the group had a basic division. Anderson, Frampton, Graves, Lillen, Rowe, and in this meeting, Scully, were not of one mind with Eisenman, but were ready to enter into debates on issues of common interest. Jack Robertson had not arrived in time for the first uh, session, but it was effective in later discussions. Nonetheless, one should not exaggerate this, this doer sacred division. With the exception of Venturi, all the other doers entered fruitfully into the discussions that followed, and they remained members of case, though perhaps less engaged than some of the spectators. Okay, my third point, that the discussion at Princeton did not look to existing models in practice. It's worth noting that the doers, and nor, nor the thinkers, offered any model from existing practice. Although at least some of the architects present were known to be admirers of the work of Luke Boussier, his work was not advanced as a model for contemporary development. There was ready dismissal of Johnson, Rudolph, Stone, Yamasaki, and star architects of the, of the moment. The Philadelphia group had worked for Louis Kahn. There was a lament that Kahn could no longer get a commission at the University of Pennsylvania. Scully had published an admiring small monograph on Kahn. Nonetheless, uh, there was only parenthetical mention of Kahn, though Scully's positive view of Kahn may have provided the animus for its negative commentary on the work of Venturi. I was a great admirer of Kahn, who had been ready to learn from his thought and work, but it appeared that all of the participants were ready to inquire into the problems and potentials of architecture, rather than to consider existing models. The case, despite doer-thinker differences, lasted for almost a decade, maybe going to the preference for exploration, rather than the adoption of existing models but also to the practical matter that three persons made continuing commitments to the group, Eisenman, myself, and after joining in 1965, Donald Lindman. But the ensuing six meetings did involve all the members, and the content of those meetings was already anticipated in the discussions at Princeton in 1964. Okay, I am my last topic from Princeton 1 selected aspects of the discussion that set the agenda for case three. And you know, <coughs> when Dylan and Anderson took on the organization of case three, what issues could we draw from the discussions at Princeton 1? 
Not surprisingly, we worked within the interests expressed by those loosely allied with Eisenman's position, and more specifically, the concerns that we ourselves had expressed. Rationality. At Princeton, Hank was dis dis disputatious at times, sometimes ironic, uh, and once the meeting turned to discussion, many concerns were briefly stated, kaleidoscopically, shifting from among topics. After a couple of thoughts were expressed using the word actually, Hank interjected. Actually, it'd be nice to find out if there are any common concerns here. Uh, Hank had long since taken a critical attitude towards Vincent Scully, so famous for his undergraduate lectures at Yale. Hank perceived in Scully a remarkable capacity for adjectives and adverbs in the excitation of hero worship in architecture. At Princeton, Scully was adamant <coughs> in their re rejection of the profession of city planning. Everything should be architecture. When the question arose as to adding new members to the group, no one coming from MIT with our esteemed sister department of planning advocating adding planners. <coughs> Scully made a heated opposing position that provoked this exchange. Study of the creativity 
and computation.
Professor Richard Held of the, of the MIT's Department of Psychology and Professor David H. Hubel of the Harvard Medical School. In 1981, Hubel shared in the Nobel Prize in Physiology or, or Medicine for theories concerning information processing in the visual system. Hank's session titled Creativity offered Murray Milne, identified through our contacts with Dominic Lindman, then head of the Department of Architecture at the University of Oregon. Milne's interest intersected with the emerging activity in computation and architecture. The second speaker was Mark Swartowski, a professor of philosophy at Boston University and a research associate in the Department of Physics Psychology at Harvard. Clearly, we were following a precept that Hank had advanced at Princeton One. Learn from anyone, refuse nothing. Hank and I also uh, chose to invite non-members of CASE who might, have, uh, might both appreciate and contribute to the lecture presentations. Among those uh, present were James Ackerman and Wayne Anderson, art historians from Harvard and MIT, respectively, Bernard Kaplan and Joachim Wolldil, psychologists from Clark University, and Sim van der Rijn from the Department of Architecture at Berkeley. The contributions of the case three speakers deserve attention that I hope one day to provide. However, the significance of case three for the case itself is easily told. Despite the discussions at Princeton that indicated interest in these issues, there was little response that got us. Case three was too esoteric and no doubt rightly criticized for the marginal expectations placed on the case members themselves. On Sunday, we were uh, snowed in at the Cot House. There was ample time to advocate a different format for case four. A more active program was necessary and came to be chaired by Richard Meyer and Michael Graves with some external participants and, and guests but persons drawn from the world of architecture. Case 4 was the result and property and aspect of the first session earlier today. Now, uh, that's what I have to say about how Case 3 uh, evolved from Case from, you know, from Princeton 1. Uh, I want to say, just maybe show some images and say a few things about uh, Case 6. So Case 6 was uh, took place in the Hayden Gallery here uh, at MIT. Hayden Gallery was actually a very important uh, locale. Uh, Wayne Anderson, our, our good colleague of HTC and of the department, he was the, so the art historian, the first art historian of, at, at MIT. And the institute very quickly saw his capacities and drew on him to be the director of a gallery in the, the space that, uh, we still know near the Hayden Library as, for chamber concerts was the Hayden Gallery. And he brought that gallery to a, a level of renown. Uh, it was the best gallery of contemporary art in Boston in those years. And he had other activities that made the arts alive here at MIT. So Wayne gave me the use of the uh, Hayden Gallery for three months and one month to prepare an exhibit. And I worked with students to both develop an exhibition, uh, develop an installation, and then an exhibition within that. And I, I found the, a new product, uh, fiberglass reinforced polyester structural sections in beautiful colors. And the, the, the Hayden Gallery was two stories high, but it had never been used, except as a ground level establishment. So we, the idea was to make a, a three-dimensional construction uh, in, in the space and then to inhabit that uh, with an exhibition. And so uh, there were a group of students who worked with me for a term on uh, both aspects of that. Uh, and it, just to give you a, a kind of small insight into it, uh, Durer's engraving of melancholy uh, was something that was very much on my mind and I took as being a kind of touchstone for what we were doing. In the engraving, you see uh, Melancholia with the architect, or really the master of builders uh, compass, and the various objects, the purity of form of the sphere, the special human but finely worked stone of the, of the work in the back. And around her, a, a lot of tools, uh, ordinary tools, in this case mostly carpentry tools, including that planes in the foreground, the plane which is you know, kind of 
complex shape. Nothing really, it seems to be especially beautiful in itself, but it's conceived in order to be able to hold to adjust the blade and finally to make a very planar surface. So the, the way in which you're working would be an attempt to, to reach something that's more perfected. And I think there's this, this tension between the idea of a perfection of form that you might be aspiring to, uh, the tools in which we have to work with their imperfections, and the in-between qualities that come through this, the, the kind of love of what is complex and articulated because it's being conformed in order to, to reach a goal, but that's not a thing that's a perfected form in itself. And that there's something of that in, in architecture as well. So that uh, the, the, the exhibition contained uh, some of the aspects of architecture that aspire to form. So, so there, was a, there was a lot of this style, uh, this the red blue chair, which is actually Peter Eisenman's chair, uh, his version of it. Uh, but there was also the original model for the Schroeder House. There was the, the Museum of Modern Arts reconstructed model of the Schroeder House. There were uh, the renderings of the Schroeder House by Mrs. Schroeder herself. She came and visited in the exhibition. Uh, and there were other objects in the exhibition that, that went to the direction of form in architecture. But there was also, uh, if you the upper left wall, you see uh, the photographs of the of Becker, Becker photographs of industrial works and decaying industrial works in Germany. These, these were loaned to us by Conrad Boxman, who came and talked about that, uh, those works. And it, 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 this was actually still very new uh, on the American scene. Uh, in the middle distance, you see uh, the great elevators in Montreal. And Del Charney came from Montreal, provided those photos and came from, from, Mel, from Montreal and talked about great elevators for the form that they are and for their role in production and in society. Uh, and then you can see uh, 19th century plows, and there were, there were a lot of 19th century woodworking objects, including planes, rather like the one in, in the Dürer. Uh, so we were trying to introduce all the kind of themes that seem somehow to be adduced uh, in the Dürer, and ask people to think about both the, the ideal and the pursuit of ideal forms as a, a very important and honorable thing, but the complexity of the world in which we produce things and the relationship of form to use and to uh, human association. We also include illustrations of the work of our colleague, Warren Smith. He was not the featured thing, but it was an under, underlying uh, concern of the students and of me that we respected the work of, of Morris Smith, uh, who was not receiving, it seemed, the attention that he deserved. And it was like to give an entire lecture uh, just on these two images about the quality of his attention to materials, uh, but they also to form and to the way of life. So the, uh, the exhibition was something that was developed in okay, a three month uh, position here at MIT and independent of case. But uh, then I did uh, call uh, a meeting of case, case six, uh, and we, we had, uh, it, it took place in the exhibition and we brought uh, speakers. Uh, so for example, Joseph Escher uh, from Berkeley, uh, somebody that was admired both by Donlan and by me, and by now Donlan was at MIT and was influential in, in bringing Escher and uh, some other uh, architects who talked about their work. Uh, Michael Graves was still a member of CASE, who was still here. There was very much a mixture and indeed heavier on non-case members and on, on case members. Uh, and so the, the K6 was a mixture of architects talking about their work and the people, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, that both uh, Conrad Broxman talking about the Becker photographs and the Mel uh, uh, Chani and the Brain Leaders, but also Lynn Klein says here about um, Henry Mercer. Uh, Henry Mercer is the, 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 the genius behind 
uh, the Mercer Museum uh, and the 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 Warden Place Reinforced Concrete House uh, in Mercer, Pennsylvania. And somebody, somebody that had this great love and concern for uh, traditional handicraft and handicraft objects that could be represented by the, the plows or the planes that you've seen here as well. So uh, that, those were the, the kind of underlying issues and content of the exhibition and, and the, the topic of case six. I have a few images too, so I will also talk from here for a bit. Um, and these are really uh, these are really meant to introduce uh, these images, uh, the context of things that were being uh, thought about in my world and the people I was around uh, on the West Coast. Uh, but I start with this photograph from uh, of the Lovejoy Fountain in Portland, uh, which is designed by Larry Halperin uh, as a chain of uh, fountains. Uh, but actually, the pavilion for it was designed by Charles Moore and Bill Turnbull, uh, my partners in our office, because I remember seeing the model name. Um, uh, it's, um, I show it here because it is extraordinary how familiar that kind of shape looks now. <laughs> but it was not then, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, and that shape is actually uh, also juxtaposed against what was very familiar to everybody and remains so, uh, which is the kind of rectilinear rationalism of the uh, 50s and early 60s. Um, so uh, that was part of it. Uh, our own work at MLGW, uh, uh, my work was part of Moore and Turnbull and Whitaker. Uh, uh, Moore and um, Turnbull and I had also been, all been at Princeton. Uh, Whitaker joined us. Uh, this is a house that we did. Um, in the year of uh, 64, which is when I went from teaching for four years at uh, Berkeley uh, to, um, uh, to Oregon. Um, uh, and then this is uh, the other thing that happened in that year, which is the design of um, C Ranch Condominium 1. Uh, and then this is a view of the setting for that, uh, not as it originally was, which was empty except for our building. Um, but as it had been by then, uh, six years uh, later. Um, uh, and uh, some of the kinds of uh, images that uh, bear on that would have to do with relating it to, to the forces of the environment, uh, to the wind and to the slope of the land and to fitting on the, on the land with as little disruption as possible. Uh, and the use of uh, heavy timber, which was uh, what had been happening on that site before. We didn't use the timber from the site itself because there was too much processing involved, but uh, that was the intent. Um, and that uh, framing um, as then providing a, a level of complexity and interest, a kind of inner landscape, as you will, if you will, inside the buildings as compared to the landscape outside. Um, lots of uh, things to say about the um, uh, debt of all this to Lucan, which is uh, part of why I'm talking about the, this as a setting for ideas that have been on. Um, um, very briefly, those had to do with the idea of um, things needing to be explained, either by being self-evident like squares, or having some connection to a uh, set of forces. Um, and that um, uh, this was meant to be the first uh, 10 of, um, of 80, um, uh, and uh, we did the site plan for the whole 
hope that all of them moving around the landscape. We'd also um, just read um, uh, Vincent Scully's uh, Art of the Temple and the Gods, so um, walking around uh, our, our building, walking around the piece of the landscape are very important. Uh, and so these are all situated as complexes, making little subclusters. And one of the things we had earlier articulated as a set of concerns was to that the that fundamentally architecture was about differentiating an inside from an outside, but at various scales, at, at various um, um, graduated scales, from an intimate little space you got into an edicula, to then an enclosure, to then a courtyard, to then a set of, of buildings that together became a set of courtyards. Alas, that extension appears at the courtyard, um, uh, but that extension didn't happen, um, and in that sense, uh, our uh, to the extent this was any kind of a model of something, it didn't go very far. Um, uh, the other work that we did at that time uh, is, uh, and it's just again to show the spirits of the time we were working in, uh, this is the uh, Moonraker Athletic Center, which was made to take the, 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 um, um, the tennis courts and put them out of the wind. The wind is a big problem. When we first started here, we were told uh, that the average wind speed on our site was 15 miles per hour, average wind speed. Uh, uh, so we got dug down into the land, used the uh, little building that is the uh, um, uh, dressing room uh, as a uh, windscreen, and then had Robert Stoffer Solomon, uh, Robert Stoffer for that, uh, make these uh, with Trump, more of these great uh, graphics inside, super graphics. Um, and then there was the, all of this, the influence of Larry Halpern. Uh, the Halpern workshops, uh, uh, one of the most dramatic of which happened at uh, Sea Ranch, uh, uh, were recently a subject of an exhibition and lectures at the Graham Foundation. Um, uh, they had to do with Anna Halpern, who uh, is uh, still a presence at the Sea Ranch. Uh, this is a, work, uh, uh, a workshop she arranged uh, in September uh, at 95, 94 she was then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, Larry's uh, work has um, governed uh, everything. Um, he did lots of um, had lots of ideas about how to engage people in participation. Uh, lots of ideas about how to make something, and a fundamental commitment that was adopted and encouraged uh, and, and absorbed by all of us to thinking that this was a place that was of wildness, and so we needed to make buildings that didn't demolish that, but worked with it, worked out of it. So that had to do with something we cared about a lot, which was that we were not in the business as a, as a set of people of trying to uh, make revolution. We were uh, interested in making things out of what is, uh, and then moving them forward, making them better, uh, uh, making uh, uh, advances, but not uh, by way of rejection, but by absorption. Um, uh, Larry also uh, influenced by Anna, the, her wonderful dancer, uh, developed a notion about scores as a way of planning, and this is his score at the top uh, for what you wanted to do on this 10 miles of coast. Um, and then uh, the below is the actual plan that's happened over around 50 years now, um, and uh, some uh, uh, of the buildings therein. Um, a lot of concern on our part for, uh, not for problem solving so much, I noticed Problem solving was part of that initial discussion, pretty clearly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, but taking the forces at work in a place and using them to make the forms out of which we would build it. Um, so it's a matter of deriving, pulling from uh, characteristics that you could recognize in the place and reinforce those characteristics to people's understanding and make architecture out of them. Uh, so the wind and the sun were the major things. Uh, and leaving a walk all along the coast. Um, so these things were made by Joe Eschrich and ourselves. Uh, these are all photographs from a somewhat later period. Um, uh, Joseph Eschrich uh, um, and uh, then uh, MLTW in a session, I don't know, um, 15 years later, um, and Bill Turnbull and Matt Sylvia, the great builder, who was a very important part of the creative process. Um, when Joe Eschrich came to uh, uh, six, I would say, uh, parenthetically, um, he, uh, his primary point that he was making, as I remember it, was that you really had to uh, work with the builder as part of your creative process. Uh, that was an essential 
uh, part of getting the kind of information that would make a building uh, worthwhile. Um, he delivered this all the while in a tweed jacket and uh, blue jeans uh, straight off the West Coast. Um, uh, his own house here, and uh, set of houses, the set of houses, original hedgerow houses he did on the right, uh, now 50 years later, 40 years later, but 45 when this was taken. And across the meadow is the last house he did uh, uh, at the Sea Ranch on the opposite side, uh, using the same set of parameters, but making a very wonderful place. Um, uh, much more quickly, this is the, uh, the one house I designed while I was in uh, uh, Eugene. Um, I was working on it about the time, um, or finishing it, I think, about the time we held the uh, case uh, meeting. Uh, and then I need to show uh, one thing uh, beyond this, uh, which is uh, uh, that while I, uh, there, I will talk more about the Oregon kitchen, uh, one of the things that also happened along the way is um, of being at MIT, being with Stanford, being in some of the discussions about the need to have a real understanding of what's going on in the place. Uh, Stanford and I developed, mostly Stanford, uh, a, um, under a Grenfell program, uh, a way of mapping how interactions took place in the city. Uh, and we actually had wonderful field trips with students to Paris to uh, map parts of Paris and see what the fabric of it was in terms of interactions, not just spatial forms. Uh, and so then I had took that same process as a visitor down to the University of Maryland, and we did five Maryland towns, um, uh, mapping them in this way and then doing building within them. Um, I have to confess that we, the cover of it, um, we deliberately took uh, uh, some pleasure in making it a white cover with the names of five towns on it. Uh, which has some corollary to a cover that you're familiar with. <laughs> uh, but it was actually, I say that because it was in fact a commitment to saying that we needed to learn from what the society was doing uh, and what the connections were um, and how that could be, uh, become a creative part of our process. Uh, this is the place I have now um, uh, and spend some of my time now. In the, in the office, we want to leave that there. Uh, the case meeting University of Oregon in Eugene in January 1967 was conceived as a teach-in at the time when intensive gatherings called teach-ins, as we pointed out earlier, were frequent on the Oregon campus as at Berkeley and other places as a way of bringing attention to the war in Vietnam, to the looming militarism. The case teach-in was not conceived as an extension of a specific agenda but rather as a way of using the special talents of the case group assembled in Oregon to bring into the culture of the school new understanding and expand its critical dimension to what was then being considered within the school. As a still relatively new leader of the Department of Architecture, under the leadership of Walter Priest, I had come as a faculty department in the fall of 64, I benefited from his knowing and enthusiastic support. He was also relatively new. Uh, with a distinguished record teaching architectural and planning history and community service. Yale Press published in, or, uh, published, um, in 1996 his book, The Search for Environment. And he had fond memories of the PhD seminar at Harvard, but became friends with William Worcester, who was adding uh, a daughter in the class in the early 40s before he became dean here at MIT. I have no doubt it was Bill who recommended me to him. Uh, the, uh, uh, I have to mention the importance of the naming in the year before, I think it was 63, 64, I'm not sure which, of the College of Environmental Design, which took the term college, the School of Architecture, and then the Landscape Program and the Planning Program, which were separately housed, and called them, put them together as the College of Environmental Design, and eventually put them together as a, a building. Um, uh, Paul, first of all, it turns out. Um, the idea was the importance of integrating the fields and concern for the larger burgeoning landscape of development in a state that was rapidly extending into new ground. Environment was used as an inclusive term of absorbing climate, landscape, and buildings, all that surround it. And design is taking action within that totality and with the interconnection of mind. College was formed, as the now Melvin had just said. Uh, the college was conceived by William Worcester uh, when he was here in uh, California, and, I mean here in, uh, <laughs> we get mixed up where we are, uh, <laughs> here at MIT, uh, before, and he went back to Berkeley in part because he expected that he could create this. Uh, 
with Captain Worcester, who was a formidable uh, force in her own and had been important to formulating the federal housing program. I believe it's correct that it was the first use of the term college of environment uh, in the country, which is now replicated uh, many times over. It was controversial uh, as it was uh, seen as threatening the dominance of the profession of, in the design professions of architecture, which included everything, of course. Uh, working within this rubric, many of us were anxious also to conceive buildings and complexes of the buildings and surroundings, to be measured by the way in which they unfolded and structured experiences and formed the context for living, domains for inhabitation, rather than works with an independent life of their own as historical artifacts, though they could be considered that way too, and tell marvelous stories about cultures and fields of study. Each generation finds new ways of discovering creative potential in the field, and following a course of action that in turn makes change in the field, though through differing approaches, differing interests, differing tools and materials for analysis, and a growing awareness of developments in other places and times. What can we learn from our experience that we commonly critically reviewed here about what has enduring impact or significance? What are the most effective ways of moving ideas about architecture to be more inclusive and more suitably motivating? What has legs? And what in the end proves to be interesting, but beside the point. In the assembly of pictures of case uh, teaching, I've been fascinated to find tracks of thought that reach over decades, and interactions have been decisive for individuals and sometimes for groups. Uh, it has reawakened some wonderful thoughts, and I won't go into the nostalgia part. Uh, or even how the Oregon context was run like, but we can pass that. Um, I would say that there is a merit in suggesting uh, that uh, uh, the inclusion, the bringing of case um, uh, to Oregon was not, was great that people were willing to come, um, uh, or was willing to have it there, and that we were able to bring people there because of Walter Creason's willing support for it. Uh, and it was seen as a way of revitalizing the school, which, in, which indeed it did. Uh, some of the themes that, that in early writings that actually, uh, my writings, that actually relate to how we were thinking about the school are choice and freedom of activity, counterpoint and improvisation, the large scheme in which parts were laid sometimes in distortion, persistence of push for communal sense of agreement and respect, plus insistence on release from strictures of convention, Hostility to the coercion of core, of two coercion of, is at the core of our beliefs. Vital importance of bringing imagination into play in the making of places. And Khan was in the background of our thoughts because we had all studied with him at Princeton in the one year that he was there. Actually, Charles didn't study with him, he was his teaching assistant. Um, so it's worth um, perhaps, um, without much analysis, just running down through it. I find um, uh, a uh, list of topics that were um, taken up in this week. So the, the format was that people came to the school, most of them for a full week, uh, and that um, they engaged in activities throughout the school. It was a total immersion in the school, and the idea was to get much more leverage out of that. Um, uh, there were seminars, there were lectures, and the two senior design courses had design projects scheduled and set up so that on the Monday of that week they'd have a review and then uh, people could scramble around and work until then they had a second review on the Friday and each review included some, some case members. So there were people, there were faculty, people they were aware with, uh, but then um, people who were totally new to the situation. Their list of seminars is impressive. Um, uh, urban planning procedures, um, uh, Newman. Problem situations of the day, which happened actually three times, I think. Um, uh, Anderson, Newman, and Breland. Environmental control. The, uh, one of the things that happened at Berkeley is that the whole question of uh, servicing of buildings, mechanical and plumbing, uh, had been transformed into a notion of something that was not to calculate plumbing loads, but was how to uh, make something that was part of the creative process. Um, and Murray Milne um, had come to Oregon uh, to teach that course. Um, he had been a graduate student of mine at, uh, uh, at Berkeley. He had previously had a mechanical engineering degree. Um, he also had been studying some of the evolving uh, computer things there, which is why he 
actually was in the previous case, because um, uh, he was actually cl uh, close at that time to uh, uh, Chris Brown Alexander and some of the people working with uh, environmental with a, a computer system. Environmental controls, we've had seminars uh, twice, I think, uh, with Reland, Murray Milne, and John Fisher, who came up from Berkeley, who had been teaching the course there, and Murray Milne had been uh, his teaching assistant. Analysis of form, I think there were two or three of those. Uh, Millen, Newman, and Early. History theory, Millen. Composition, Early and Gray. Uh, design procedures related to problem types, Fisher. Uh, design process, CAD analysis, Mill. Nice making and problem solving, Hill. Current work, Barbara Frasca, Tim Breland, and John Fisher. Uh, there were lectures uh, by, uh, on the New York City project uh, that uh, um, Hank and Stan gave, uh, on a Harlem project, which is a matter of controversy, I'll come back to that later if we have time. Uh, current work by Liskum, uh, Liskum Okamoto, and Hill, and Michael Graves, um, and uh, the New York City Project of Graves, the first design award for PA that year, and Bill Tenn, which I thought it was, uh, and uh, Habitat um, uh, 67, uh, which uh, uh, David Reinhardt, whom I just hired to the faculty, had uh, worked on at Softies. Um, so that, uh, I'll stop now, and we can uh, now come back for further questions.
Uh, that was, and then Kekas came in 49, that was sort of the beginning of a type of conversation about, about modernism. And it sort of took on sort of slow form. Kekas uh, gave these classes where students had to make paper objects. Um, and did sort of certain types of modernist uh, sort of design exercises. Um, and then there was a period in the 50s where people were coming and going. Uh, Fuller came in 52, Shermayoff was uh, floating around. Uh, Khan, uh, 56, um, uh, and then uh, Maury Smith came in uh, 52, um, and then he, he, he left, went back home, then he uh, was brought back by Belushi when he uh, became, uh, when he came here in, in, in 56. And then, uh, so in the 60s, um, there was sort of this sort of strange group of people, right, who, uh, you know, floating around, uh, young talent, uh, not really uh, formed yet in an institutional way. There was no real mandate from outside to act like an institution. And so it was a, a, a moment and a time when one could sort of rethink and challenge uh, the norm, and the norm was, uh, you know, in some sense sort of up, up the street. And two, also when um, Catalano came, now there I'm a little uncertain, it was 60, some, sometime in the 60s. Um, and that created a sort of a divide between different types of modernism, right? There was a sort of the more informal modernism, let's get together um, and do things with student activism, urban activism. Then there was the Catalano, which was more formal, structural, um, big time uh, type of thing. And uh, Maurice Smith um, sort of negotiated a sort of split between these camps. And when I was talking with Maurice Smith, and he still he doesn't call Catalano Catalano, he calls him the fascist. I mean, you know, that was his word for him. You know, I couldn't be a little while to figure out who he was talking about. He said, you know, are you a friend of the fascist? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he meant Catalano. <laughs> uh, so there was you know, a lot of uh, tension, you know, between, you know, what was, the, you know, uh, the direction for architecture in a very core and fundamental way. And in some sense, I think what we're seeing here in these uh, presentations is that how Case, in some sense, trying to sort of articulate a response uh, to, to several types of modernism. There was, the, you know, there was the post-war professional. There was a sort of a high modernism of, of, of Gropius and, and, and Mies, um, and then there was, um, uh, you know, a type of, of um, monumental modernism, if you will, that was perhaps emerging. Um, and filling in a type of needs, looking for um, alternatives to this, um, um, I think was sort of uh, one of the core core projects. So I thought I would just sort of throw a little bit of that, perhaps footnote to institutional history, because I think it's sort of relevant. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to but uh, actually, Lawrence Anderson had been here since I think 1936. Uh, and was head of the design program almost all the time. Uh, and then the, then the architecture department was formed, and then uh, he became dean. Um, he also, in what, 38, uh, designed the alumni swimming pool, which was a very fine example of modern architecture. Uh, and the um, institution had committed to it. I know that, unfortunately, was ruined in part by one of his firm's later buildings, which cast a shadow onto the beautiful sunny space. But, um, uh, the, um, he was a great, wonderful teacher who supported people and made way for them all, all along. Uh, uh, but um, uh, also, um, um, William Worcester, when he was the dean, was very, very uh, effective at bringing people and gaining commission for modern architecture. I mean, we have an alto building. That's because of Bill Worcester. Uh, uh, and, uh, right. Um, what? Yeah, right. Um, well, no, and also the Baker House. He brought, uh, yeah. So he, uh, one hundred more on drive was uh, Worcester uh, making a team of his faculty to make a building. So those were really fine, good, strong examples of modern architecture that was not doctrinaire like some of the street, uh, <laughs> and showed different kinds of modernism. Um, not as a programmatic display thing, but just because they were sponsoring things by people who were thinking in a slightly different way. Well, the others. Well, yeah. 
add one more thing about that. Uh, you know, MIT emerged as the great technical university that it is during World War II. So it had to do with rocketry and radar and things like that. And the, the, you know, I think our goal only found problems so high, but never was thought that that's what science had brought us. So with the end of the war, we, we had a, a much stronger institution, we had very important scientists and engineers, and they also had developed a conscience about you know, what have we done? What is science? Bringing this. We have to make sure that the students we train have a, 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 dis, a, dis, a dis, disparate uh, education in the arts, in the humanities. And so the beginning of the humanities program here, and the beginning of the arts program here, uh, that program, but also the worst would be so much a sympathetic figure in that, that the, one of the reasons is that we get the awful buildings and the uh, chapel uh, and the uh, worst of the price is that they are responding to the idea that there should be a humane environment here. So I'm going to try out a proposal, <clears throat> on, um, especially Stanford and, and Donna, because I'm, I'm hearing a kind of emergent, I don't know, episteme or, or problematic that, I mean, I think there's a risk of some of these things starting to fly apart. There's so much information and so many diverse um, Themes, but I'm actually hearing some coherence. But also, my, my proposal is motivated uh, for a different reason, which is to um, defeat a dichotomy that I heard emerging in the first session a dichotomy between the formal and the social dimensions of architecture. And I know that the dichotomy is going to be increased in the next panel when we talk about the whites and the grays, and it's going to start to polarize. But, but I actually want to try to defeat that, that dichotomy based on some of the things that, that have been said this afternoon. Um, and I'm also thinking at the same time about the legacy of CASE. And one of the things that I know from my own experience at MIT, um, Stanford will later, I don't know when exactly you start talking about semi-autonomy, the concept of semi-autonomy. Uh, but this was a big concept when, when I was first year in the late beginning of the late 70s. Um, it, it comes partly, uh, Stanford mentioned being attracted early to Karl Popper, but a kind of protege of Karl Popper, or uh, Imre Lakatosh, was someone who was equally, maybe even in some ways, more important for Stan. And uh, Lakatosh has the concept of, of a research project, which is this, this intellectual project that we've been talking about, this intellectual project of architecture could be modeled on that which has on the one hand an internal history which is made up of, of its own sort of autonomous structures and conventions, um, but also what we in contemporary terms might call a disciplinary history or a sort of internal history to the project, but it also has an external history. And those two histories interact, sometimes antagonistically, sometimes smoothly, sometimes non-synchronously, sometimes they line up, but there's an interaction. So hence, I think semi-autonomy, which is, by the way, very different. If my students are here, Althusser also uses the term semi-autonomy, but that's not what Stan meant, I think. And semi-autonomy, to me, gives, starts to give us a way of talking about the formal and the social together, as Donlin, I think, when you showed the work, very much did. Um, um, and, 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 and I heard that, again, I heard a dichotomy emerging this morning that I think the concept of semi-autonomy defeats. The other thing that um, I think I was looking, this, this was a very, um, I think, minor part of the archive that we <clears throat> looked at, but I was struck, Mr. Stan's notes, they look very, very unfinished, but it's a pro proposal for a seminar next year. Uh, the topic's iconology, um, and what do people respond to universally? That, the, the universally first really, really surprised me. Uh, I, I think Stan would, would, not, would not think like that later, that, 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 that someone, that, you, that there was a universal uh, response. But I was trying to think, and also iconology, this is not a concept that we, I think, at least not at Harvard, maybe you guys still talk about it here, from Panofsky. And I was trying to think what can hold together what kind of idea can hold together 
a notion of universality of response, a kind of universal disposition or universal reaction, and also iconology, which is a very controversial, which was a controversial concept in art history from Penofsky because it involves not, not individual response, but a kind of, I would even call it a deep structural um, condition. It's more than just looking at icono uh, sorry, iconology. It's more than looking at iconography as a symptom. Iconology is actually kind of a deep structural condition. And what I want to propose, and this is, I guess I'll propose it as a question, I think some notion of structure was starting to emerge early, 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 63, 64, 65, structure in the sense that on the one hand, the structure of architecture, on the one hand, architecture has an internal coherence, an internal ordering system, uh, an internal disciplinary history. On the other hand, and look at up there with Hank, uh, intensive and extensive space. On the one hand, it, it, it has an internal structure, but it also produces effects. But also, that is to say, it had intensive as the kind of internal organization of architecture. Extensive as its external effects it would be one way of reading that. But also, it can respond to external effects. But it responds as architecture. It responds as an autonomous um, organizing system, as a, an autonomous mode of thought. And I think the only thing to me that, well, one of the things that would hold together a lot of these diverse themes would be some emergent notion of structure. And then, and then I'm thinking also, and, this, and I'll stop here, Donlin's description of this sort of peripatetic architecture, this architecture that on the one hand, you have to bodily move through, um, it, 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 it draws in different vectors of wind and sun, climatic factors, geographical factors, mater different material, constructional factors, but it draws it in uh, as architecture. It, 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 it organizes all these divergent conditions uh, as architecture unfolding in time, peripatetically, as you, as you walk through it. I, I think that's gotta, it's got to be structured, again, that, that holds all those things together. Anyway, and I think, I know structure was something for you, Stan, that certainly comes later. But I'm, but I'm arguing that it was emergent even in maybe case three, three and five. I'm also reminded that it, even if you don't think it was, it doesn't, doesn't mean <laughs> the, very, the, very, the very nature of the idea of structure would not, it wouldn't matter if you disagreed or not. So that, <laughs> some form, but you know, I never did bring it to the form that I should have brought to it, and I really still ought to, because I think it is an important uh, idea. And it, 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 what I was seeing with the, the, your great it goes back to the we, We're not really presented with a problem with a uh, world that is so simple. It, it, we, we have quite properly ambitions to ideal conditions and to knowledge and the, 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 the correct form of things. But then we also have to deal with the reality of how, how complex our techniques of making things and how are we are interacting with them and what they like. But, and it doesn't, it doesn't come together all so neatly. So the, uh, the idea of semi autonomy. Uh, uh, Sarah Whiting was here and gave a lecture, um, I think it was within the last year. Uh, and uh, you know, she's very interested in the idea of autonomy, but you know, trying to keep it from falling into all the collapses that, that usually applies, and looking for the, for the way in which it is part of a more complex understanding of architecture. So she, she kind of recited my, my quasi-autonomy ideas, and then sort of observed, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard for her, it's been hard for me to get people to listen to it, because there's, there's so much attraction for polar positions. You know, it's the one way or the other, and as soon as you start saying, there's some way these interact, it's not like a whip. Nobody will listen. Mm -hmm.
uh, eloquent about how it was going to make people alert to the intricacy of intimate, of, of intimate spaces, of the engagement with things which were small, as well as things which were larger and industrial, as well as schools. But that there's a graduation of that uh, in scale, and that has seemed very important. Um, and was one of the things, actually, that the, uh, uh, there's an article on the exhibit of MIT's lofty practicums, um, I think that's the phrase. Um, uh, where one of the things that happened when I arrived is um, that the previous term um, a group, it wasn't Morris's class, I think it was somebody else's, uh, had built a mezzanine um, in the, um, one of the drafting rooms. Um, and um, it was torn down by the building department. Uh, and that had been quite traumatic. Uh, and so when I arrived a little early in the summer, I was taken aside by a group of students for dinner, a nice dinner, um, and uh, told the story and then said, and so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> because we're going to build another one. Uh, and so I went home and thought about that a little bit. Um, and one of the things we have been interested in uh, around Berkeley is trying to see what really are the interactions between people and form. So I uh, wrote up a, a, a proposal for a space use laboratory uh, and presented it to Jerry Reiser. Uh, and saying that this was a place where people could build something, they could live in it, they could evaluate it, they could see how it affected other people, uh, and learn all kinds of things by doing it. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, had a, a process that featured a faculty member, a member of the building department, and a student. And they would approve what was proposed. Um, and we turned green. He was a great man. Uh, <laughs> I got a call one day at the other end of a campus uh, by the faculty member who said, you better come here. And I said, why? And he said, well, we've approved a plan. And I said, well, that's great. No, you better come here. <laughs> and finally, after several entreaties, I, I came back across the campus uh, to the sound of sledgehammers and dust, and uh, the, the studio was sort of being torn apart. Um, uh, and uh, it uh, took some time for the uh, uh, creative energies to uh, overcome what had been the destructive, uh, rebellious energy, but they did. And it then became something which became, as we now say, viral. <laughs> and at one point, all the studios had uh, yeah. mezzanine built structures in them. And eventually, there was one authorized by the president, uh, made out of Unistrat, to be in the main lobby and come up and crawl over the, uh, onto the second floor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it received a kind of uh, institutional position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the major agents sitting in John Jerry. Yes, yes, I was very much involved. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have time just, just for um, a couple of questions, a question. So much around. Um, it's kind of hard to pin one thing that I want to ask about, but uh, I really appreciate. Sorry, I really appreciated the uh, recording of the discussion of the discipline, uh, sort of the formation of the intellectual discipline that Henry Mullen was talking about. But it seems that uh, in the way that it's constructed through what you're just showing someone about the use of space and bodies and in this relationship between environment and bodies, but counterpoint to the intellectual discipline, the rationality. I'm curious if that construction of the discipline was um, being done so that it could let in or create a productive friction between architecture as a discipline and other disciplines. So this kind of ties back to the question Felicity didn't get to ask at the last panel about the role of social sciences. So I'm curious, for example, if in that space use laboratory was the fourth member a member of another faculty, the psychology or sociology or anthropology and sort of were these connections, were you trying to establish these kind of connections in pedagogy coming from those earlier disciplinary discussions? Uh, no, in the case of that space use laboratory, we didn't, and that was probably a mistake. Uh, I must say that the, uh, uh, the specific um, uh, 
careful observation that I had envisioned at the outset of uh, never took place. Um, uh, and that was partly a lack of follow-up on my part, but also was uh, people were getting a lot of something else out of it that was much more important to them. On the other hand, Stan's construction in Hayden Laboratory uh, took many of those same ideas that emerged during that period, worked with them, worked in a very disciplined way with a very uh, uh, carefully chosen material, uh, and set up with a real rationale about how that went together. A rationale that did not, in fact, as far as I know, preclude some uh, errant imagination. <laughs> um, we've actually gone a little bit over time, so I'm going to end it here. Uh, on the morning, what do I say? There's coffee outside? Go get it and come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>